Um, no, nah, I can't say I, I can't say I seen him. I heard him in there. Okay, when you say you heard him, what did you mean? Heard him singing every morning. Okay, you heard him singing. Uh, what kind of things did you hear him sing? Uh, gospel music, uh, Drake. And your door is directly across the hall from where Mr. Jones' apartment was, correct? Yes, ma'am. And so <clears throat> in the mornings, were you inside of your apartment when you heard Mr. Jones singing or outside of your apartment? Uh, I'll probably hear him when I come out, lock my door. I hear him. Okay. So from in the hallway, you can hear his activities inside his apartment. Mm -hmm. Yes? You have to say it out loud. I'm sorry. Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> May I approach you? Yes. This is Jacqueline Lukeman with the Real News Network. As the nation was still debating the public expressions of forgiveness by black people toward ex-cop and convicted murderer Amber Geiger, one of the witnesses against her, Joshua Brown, was murdered in Dallas just a few days after the trial. Dallas PD claimed that Brown's murder was the result of a drug deal gone wrong, and there are three people in custody for the crime. But just as we wondered what the outpouring of forgiveness toward Geiger in that courtroom could mean for how we talk about racism in this country, in the case of Joshua Brown's murder, is that an indication of something bigger than the tragic story that it's being presented to us as? Here to talk with me about this today is Glenn Ford. Glenn is the co-founder and executive editor of the Black Agenda Report, and the author of The Big Lie, an analysis of U.S. media coverage of the Grenada invasion. Glenn, thank you so much for joining me today. Oh, thanks for having me. So people were already discussing, Glenn, at length, the deeply problematic implications of the responses uh, by several Black people in that courtroom to Amber Geiger uh, after the trial. And then just a few days later, one of the witnesses, Joshua Brown, is murdered. Now, of course, these are incidents that stem from the same trial. But I have to ask you, do you see connections between the uh, expectation of public performative forgiveness by Black people toward white violence and the death of Joshua Brown? Well, I think many of us felt a whiplash when we saw the goings on in that courtroom. Uh, initially, with the verdict, uh, there was deep satisfaction in the black community uh, that a white police officer would be convicted of murder, even if it was an off-duty white police officer, uh, in the killing of a black person. Uh, but then we saw a different story. And I think it's the unfolding saga of uh, something like what we at Black Agenda Report call the Black misleadership class. Uh, those Black folks who seek not liberation, not even justice for Black folks, but some kind of modus vivendi, uh, a way of living with white power structures. Uh, that's the way many of us interpreted the Black judges hugging of the person she had just uh, presided over a, uh, a trial that convicted that person of murder of a Black uh, person, uh, and also hugging of that same defendant by the victim's uh, brother. That was uh, a shock to us. We saw a Black police spokesman uh, give the notification of, of the police's version of how Joshua Brown was killed. And I don't think it was my imagination or the imagination of others who I spoke with who viewed that television presentation uh, that this Black uh, police spokesman seemed to be saying very pointedly uh, how one, two, and then the third suspect in the killing of Joshua Brown were Black males, Black males. Black males, as if the police were saying, see, we didn't do it. It was a black male that did it. Uh, and this was a black male police officer uh, taking that kind of attitude. It was quite obvious. So, yeah, this, this, this case has been a whiplash, and it has uh, many levels of interpretation. And, and I'm glad you, you brought up that, that 
press conference by the Dallas PD because there are already serious questions about the events surrounding Joshua Brown's death. Uh, the PD, the Dallas PD issued a statement uh, naming these three people who were in custody, uh, saying that this was all the result of a drug deal uh, uh, that they had with Joshua Brown that went wrong. Now, there are details of this story, the fact that the men allegedly drove from over 300 miles away to buy marijuana and THC capsules from Brown, that Brown allegedly shot first, uh, and that uh, he was shot in return, and he died as, as a result of his wounds. But the key thing, I think, in this discussion is that people immediately took to social media and challenge the Dallas PD directly on their Twitter feed, actually, uh, on this story. Glenn, are people suspicious, suspicions of some type of police malfeasance in this case valid? And, and if they are, why? Well, they're justified by history. Any Black person that is not suspicious of a police story is, uh, in a sense, out of their mind. Uh, but the particulars of this case are quite suspicious. Uh, common sense says, why would uh, people drive up 300 miles uh, for a dope connection? Uh, certainly, Joshua Brown was not the cartel. Uh, and then uh, guns start blazing almost uh, immediately. That just doesn't seem like a good day's work uh, for anybody involved in just small-time uh, druggery. Uh, so, but of course, we're looking at a a police force uh, that, uh, despite having a black police chief, a city despite having a black mayor, uh, is known for brutality. But that doesn't make it stand out. All of these police forces uh, are known for their brutality against black folks. We understand that the criminal justice system in the United States was shaped around uh, the objective of containing and controlling black people. And most white folks who are in jail uh, can consider themselves collateral damage of a racist system. Now, in fact, if we look at the issue of black people who stand up for themselves against police, police brutality specifically, we do see a disturbing pattern emerging, don't we? Um, because we can most recently cite the, mo the mysterious deaths of at least six activists who were involved in the protests in Ferguson, Missouri, after the murder of Michael Brown by Ferguson police officer Darren Wilson. Now, in this case, the DOJ report that investigated that department found a widespread pattern and practice of racist targeting of black people in every level of the Ferguson quote unquote justice system. And even in this case, not as many people are aware of the issue of Ronnie Babs, better known as Bunny, whose cell phone video captured the aftermath of Botham John's murder, who says she was fired from her job after people called her employer, accusing her of being a radical anti-police black extremist. And she's uh, also received and continues to receive death, re death threats. Glenn, are the Ferguson deaths and what is happening to Ronnie Babs the only examples of this kind of unexplained calamity befalling activists who challenge police authority? No, and in fact, uh, I'm of advanced age, and there has always been uh, rumors uh, and suspicions of police conspiracies in the deaths of activists who went too soon. Uh, certainly in Ferguson, uh, those uh, beliefs are rife. And, and I want to mention uh, that uh, in addition uh, to suspicion of the police, a well-deserved deserved suspicion, uh, Ferguson, St. Louis itself, is surrounded by white, uh, dom uh, predominantly white counties that are full of very active racist organizations. Mili militias uh, abound in the state of Missouri. Uh, and it is well known uh, that police in Missouri uh, are close to those militias, not only tolerate those militias, uh, but seem to have political sympathies with them. So who the perpetrators uh, are uh, is a bigger question than, than just the police. Mm. So I want to take another step back 
a little bit farther and look at this issue from an even wider perspective of not just police departments, local police departments, but Black activists have recently been named as, quote, uh, Black identity extremists, end quote, by the FBI, the Federal Bureau of, of Investigation and designated a threat more dangerous than even white supremacists. Now, even though the actual murders committed by white supremacists recently has forced the U.S. domestic intelligence uh, intelligence apparatus to slightly shift their stance on who's more of a threat, the fear of surveillance, infiltration, and retaliation among Black activists today is very real. But, Glenn, this is also not a new concern among black, ac- black activists, is it? Well, the FBI knows a great deal uh, about white extremists. It has always used them for uh, its own purposes. Uh, they claim, the FBI claims, that it uses white uh, extremists, uh, Ku Klux Klan and militia folks, uh, in order to spy on those organizations. But that's clearly not the case, uh, because we don't see uh, extensive arrests of those people. So their spies must be lying to them. Uh, a, a significant proportion of the bank robberies in this country uh, over decades uh, have been committed by these white extremist groups uh, that periodically raid the banks in order to uh, uh, buy weapons and ammunition and, and keep their underground activities going. Uh, so these these are major uh, operations, much of them above ground and, and totally visible. But the FBI downplays them, uh, puts them uh, on a low priority. Uh, it reminds me of how J. Edgar Hoover, uh, until deep into the 60s and close to his own death, uh, pretended that there was no mafia, there was no organized crime. And uh, the FBI continues that legacy by uh, low rating uh, the existence of uh, white uh, extremist organizations uh, whose members or sympathizers uh, have now uh, begun engaging in periodic mass shootings. And yet their priority is us, black folks, not black identity extremists, I don't even know what that is, uh, but we can talk about the FBI's definition, Uh, but black people and animal rights activists, people who almost never kill anybody. Hmm. Now, you you brought up what the, (coughs) the FBI's definition of a black identity extremist is. What, what is that? Why, and why is that important? Yeah, I'll read the definition to you. Uh, it seems rather tame, but actually it's quite uh, insidious. <clears throat> they uh, call black identity extremists those who use force or violence in violation of criminal law in response to perceived racism and injustice in American society. Uh, And they believe that the motives of these black identity extremists involve uh, their desire to establish, and this is the really important part, to establish a separate black homeland or autonomous black social institutions, communities, or governing organizations inside this country. Well, establishing autonomous black social institutions, communities, or governing organizations within the United States encompasses uh, everybody who supports community control of the police and community control of the schools and any kind of social organization, black-only organization in the United States. Uh, They could indict the NAACP on that kind of profile. What they have done is profile all black political activity. They have made black politics an outlaw uh, occupation. Uh, That's the danger in this kind of language. But of course, that's what cops of all varieties do. Mm. Uh, They profile and we're at the top of the profile and then you attach a crime uh, to what you have already, the people that you've already profiled. Mm. Now, bringing it back to the tragic murder of Joshua Brown, let's say that the three people in custody confirm Dallas PD's story, and they all admit to the claims. Is there still reason to be wary that all is not what it seems in this case? 
Well, we know how police manipulate people that they have arrested, have in their custody, and whose fate they have in their hands. Oh, we all have heard a hundred stories of what police do. So once the cops have you, any story that comes out of that uh, is, by definition, suspect, and for good historical reason. Glenn Ford, I want to thank you so much for being with me today and discussing this issue and hopefully giving a clearer uh, view of what may seem like a conspiratorial argument to some people, but is actually based on a very long history, a very long and troubled history uh, with the intelligence and law enforcement apparatus in this country. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you for watching. This is Jacqueline Lukeman with The Real News Network in Baltimore.